Okay, Jordan, whenever you're ready. Extra, extra, read all about it. The Chicago White Sox throw the World Series. That's right, friends, you heard me right. Chicago, 1919 Chicago White Sox, quite possibly the best baseball team ever put together, have thrown the game's biggest event, the World Series. Now, when I first heard about this, I was watching a movie called Eight Men Out. It's an older movie from the late 1980s, but it's really good. It's got a lot of bigger name stars like John Cusack and Martin Sheen, or Charlie Sheen, and Christopher Lloyd my favorite, the Back to the Teacher series. Uh, it talks all about how they did, how they threw the World Series, like why they did it, and the aftermath. But when I watched it, I couldn't believe that the best team in history would want to throw the, the biggest game. But I, So I did a little research, and I soon learned why it would. And it helped me understand, but I still don't agree with why they did it. So I'm going to talk about the factors and why they wanted to throw the World Series, who was involved in the World Series itself, and the aftermath of their actions. So first off, the Chicago White Sox were owned by a man named Charles Smith. He was known for underpaying all of his players, and he's a real greedy man, and he, he <coughs> promised things, but didn't really come through with his promises. Now, he built Comiskey Park, which is where the White Sox still play today. And <coughs> like I said, he prom like gave incentives to players, like one player, Eddie Seacock, was a pitcher, and he said if he were to win 30 games, he'd get a $10,000 bonus. And back in the 1919 days, like the players were getting maybe $3,000 a year, so a $10,000 bonus was huge. But Kamiski, once Seacock got to about 29 wins, there were two weeks left in the season, and they don't have a five-man rotation back then. They had maybe three players, so he would have got three, four more starts. But Kaminsky sat him in preparations for the playoffs, so he never got to his 30 wins, and Kaminsky didn't have to pay the $10,000. Um, another one was he offered, he gave, told the players that there'd be a big bonus if they won the AL pennant which they did, and their bonus was just a bunch of flat champagne. <laughs> so. And another thing, uh, he also made the players pay to wash their own uniforms, and the players didn't want to do that, so they just wore their uniforms without washing them, which is how they got the nickname the Black Sox, because their uniforms were so dirty. But it, people tend to think of the Black Sox as the players involved in the scam. Now, because of this man, Chick Gandell on the right wanted to get back at it. And he thought, how can I get back? Well, let's throw the World Series. He wanted, Comiskey wanted to win the World Series more than the players did. But Chick wanted his revenge. He wanted money. He wanted everything. So he was thinking he'll throw the World Series. They are the best team in baseball. They're the high favorites to win. So if a place a bet against them would be a huge return. But he doesn't have the money. So he goes through a friend to the New York mobster Arnold Rothstein, who promised the players involved $100,000, which again back then is a lot of money. But he knows that he needs more help than just him. He plays first base, and if he were to throw the World Series by himself, he'd be letting the balls go, and everybody would know. So he found other players who hated Charles Comiskey as much as him. <laughs> players like Eddie Seacock and Lefty Williams, two of the starting pitchers. 
And if you had two starting pitchers, you could pretty much throw the World Series by just that. But he also got Sweet Risberg, the shortstop. Over here we got Happy Felch, who is a center fielder. And Fred McMullen, he kind of overheard. He's more like a bench player, a guy that nobody cares about. But he overheard, and they decided to include him so he didn't go to the cops or anything like that. Now, Bucky Weaver was the third baseman. He was against it the whole time. He played his heart out. The eight men out is following him the whole time. And how he didn't want to be a part of it, but got sucked into it because he didn't tell anybody. And Shoeless Joe Jackson was the left fielder. He was kind of not the most educated player, but he's one of the greatest baseball players that ever lived. And so he was a part of it just because they wanted to include him. They felt he deserved it. But he, again, also played his heart out. He had a World Series record 12 hits, never committed an error, and hit the only home run for the White Sox in the World Series. So now that they have the players and the financial backing, they're going to go do the picks. And uh, what they did was Arnold Rothstein told the players that if the fix was on, that Eddie Seacock game one starter had to hit the first batter with a pitch, and he did it on the second pitch, just to pull some suspicions off. And they ended up losing the first two games, and the middleman, his name was Sleepy Bill Burns, a former pitcher himself, but wasn't very good. He put everything that he had, including the money for the players, on game three, for the Reds, but game three they had a pitcher who was a stud rookie who wasn't part of the fix, and he threw the game of his life, and some of the players started to have second thoughts about drawing the World Series, so they ended up winning game three, ended up losing an eight, because in 1919 it was a nine game series instead of seven, and none of the fans were any of the wise. But some rumors flew, and Charles Comiskey wanted to get to the bottom of it, and he offered $10,000 to anybody who had information about the fix. And jo Shoeless Joe Jackson actually confessed to it, and so did Eddie Seacock. So he, Comiskey ended up in suspending all of his, all of the eight players, and this was almost a full year after, in 1920, right near playoff time, and they were in the AL pennant, but he suspends eight or seven players because Chip Gandell was no longer playing. And they end up losing the pennant, <coughs> and he hired this Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who ended up becoming the game's first commissioner of baseball. And he federally indicted all eight players they were found innocent because the confessions had disappeared and there was no hard evidence against them. But he still, after the trial, came up with this quote, regardless of the verdict of juries, no player who throws a ball game, no player who undertakes or promises to throw a ball game, no player who sits in conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means of throwing a ball game are discussed and does not promptly tell his club about it will ever play professional baseball again. Now, this quote puts Shoeless Joe Jackson and Bucky Weaver <coughs> out of baseball, even though they played their hearts up, played airless baseball, and hit the ball like none other. Because they sat in conference, and they did not tell anybody about it. So they're all suspended. Bucky Weaver and Shoeless Joe Jackson tried to get back into baseball. They tried pleading their case, but were unsuccessful, and Shoeless Joe is regrettably out of the Hall of Fame. He is very deserving. Um, but, well, now we know how they did it, why they did it, and what happened afterwards, so if you'll excuse me, I need to get back to work. Extra, extra, read all about it.